Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. I am so happy to be here with Professor Michael Ashbacker. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Okay. Michael, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? I'm Shaler Arthur Hanish, uh, Professor of Mathematics Emeritus. Now, Shaler Arthur Hanish, is that one person, three yes, people? that's one person. That's the name, Shaler Arthur Hanish. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about Shaler Arthur Hanish? Not Hanish? very much. Uh, he's no longer with us, and his family wanted to do something to make his name live on, so they endowed two professorships in, back in the 90s. Did Hanish have any connection to mathematics or to Caltech? Not the, well, must have had some connection to Caltech because the development uh, got them to commit to, to fund these two uh, professorships, but I don't have any memory of a deep connection. For example, I don't think he went to school here, but I'm not sure of that. Michael, what year did you go emeritus? Uh, 2013. And in what ways have you remained connected to Caltech and the research since that time? Well, in every way except for I no longer have to teach or serve on committees. So it gives you extra bandwidth mathematics. to just work on the research. Mm -hmm. And just as a snapshot in time, what are you working on right now? Well, here we now we <laughs> we'll get into the into technical stuff. I'm working on uh, trying to prove one portion of the classification of the finite simple groups in the category of fusion systems. Is this a long-standing project or new? Well, it depends. Well, these terms are relative, but I've been working on it for 10 years at least. Do you still work with graduate students or postdocs? Uh, here, no. I may encounter graduate students or postdocs and when I go go to some meeting or go to somebody else's university, but I haven't had any graduate students in a long time, or postdocs. Michael, as a mathematician, it's a question we're all dealing with, but in the pandemic, where we all had to socially isolate and not go to work, was that an ideal situation for you, at least from a research perspective? No, it wasn't a terrible burden, but it was nice to travel and uh, to see people, uh, so that you know, two years, year and a half is a long time to to give that up. But and also uh, before COVID, I was used to coming in here to to my office and spending a lot of time in the office. And with COVID, with nobody around, there didn't seem any reason. I, I live very very near here. I walk to school, so there didn't seem seem to be any reason to. To spend a lot of time in my office. As a matter of fact, I probably wasn't supposed to. I wasn't supposed to spend as much time as I did, but uh, so uh, it altered. I work more at home now. But And did that conform to your usual work style of, of researching solo, or do you generally work with other people, collaborators? I don't. I've certainly collaborated, but that's not my uh, normal style. The modern mathematician seems to be very collaborative, and even back in my day, I was less collaborative than, than most. So you harken back maybe to even an earlier generation in mathematics. Right. Yes, that's right. Michael, some overall questions right now that might help translate your specialty to our broader audience, and that is, what is the overall field in mathematics that you work in? What would you call that? Well, I work in several, but primarily I work with finite groups. Okay. So if we can break this down maybe in, in, a, in a decision tree. So let's say, for example, a graduate student in physics. Maybe one of the first binaries that they would have to choose would be experimental or theoretical physics. What would be in mathematics that first binary, that first choice that all mathematics graduate students would have to make? Maybe pure and applied mathematics. Okay, pure and applied mathematics. Applied mathematics means whatever, whoever is in on the faculty at the particular institution that's applied. 
So how do you understand pure mathematics versus applied mathematics? Applied toward what? Let's start there. Well, it could be any semi-real world problem. For example, when I came here in the faculty, applied mathematics at Caltech meant fluid dy dynamics. But that, I don't think it means anything like that anymore. What does it mean now? I don't know. I don't <laughs> lost connection with the uh, applied group. Besides, there would also be what I would think of as applied math mathematicians that are in other groups other than the applied mathematics group. And so for you in graduate school, that first binary decision would have been pure mathematics. Yes, but I made that decision as an undergraduate. As an undergraduate. Yeah. Okay. And then if we could further break down pure mathematics, what would be the next step in your mind? Well, maybe broad, uh, broad um, areas of mathematics, uh, analysis, algebra, geometry, topology, foundations. Probably there's a few more. And then from you know, there, what, what did you develop as your area of specialty? What now? My no, as, as a graduate student. So well, as a graduate student, yeah. I was, when I was an undergraduate here, I was an undergraduate, by the way, not just right. the, the faculty. A faculty, a couple of faculty members got me interested in certain type of combinatorics, and that's why I went to the University of Wisconsin. They had a good combinatorist named Bruck, who in theory I worked with. And uh, so I solved whatever problem I set for myself and took it to him, and that was okay. I had to stick around for three years because uh, of the way that the rules were written at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, as I was there, and, and the way I approached my thesis problem, with, I was doing more finite group theory, permutation group theory, than the combinatorics, and I got interested to that with that and my first job it was a year at the University of Illinois with the, where there were two very good finite group theorists so by then I was decided I would be a finite group theorist which you know at that time it was a very hot area too so it was better for a young mathematician to be in. Now, now let me ask some questions about finite groups in historical context. Where do we first encounter the term finite groups? How far back does that go? Oh, hundreds of years. Nineteenth century. Nineteenth no, century. Not well, it's hundred and a half years, maybe. And what what are some of the the key ideas behind finite groups? Well, first you have to come to the notion of a group, and then and initially, do you know the the name Gawa or Abel? No. These are two people who, Gawa has this very romantic uh, life. He was killed at the age of, I don't know, maybe still in his 20s, no, still maybe less than 20, or early 20s, something like that, in a duel. And he left, he had solved this great problem and supposedly had written down uh, his, the mathematics that he had just done before going out in the duel and he got killed, not, not exactly in the duel, but he was stabbed in the stomach and died of intestinal problems a few days later. And he had sent this work, the work that he wrote down he gave to a friend, but he had sent copies of it to Cauchy, who was the uh, great French mathematician of the time, and Cauchy lost his, <laughs> his papers. <laughs> so his work was not appreciated until about 30 years after his, his, uh, his death, some, somehow, uh, maybe it was Lagrange or somebody, came upon his work and read it carefully enough to understand that it was very important. And so group theory, group theory existed in some proto-mathematical form before Galois, but, and, but sort of Galois gave the impetus, I think, to group theory beginning. So that would be in the, probably in the mid-19th century. And this is taking place... Although the notion of an abstract group wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, come into being until maybe 30 years later. And wh where did that happen? In the work of some German mathematicians. Okay. 
in French mathematicians. When when does this start in the United States? Well, in the United States, early uh, 20th century. Mm -hmm. And in terms you of your... To, you have to remember or know that mathematics in the United States was, wasn't worth very much until uh, the second quarter of the 20th century, maybe. And even then, not so much. And what changed? Well, universities started to, in the United States, started to become better. They started to, mathematicians stayed in the United States rather than going abroad. Uh, big impetus came with the uh, Second World War and the support of all sorts of science by the federal government. What are some of the big questions in finite group theory? What does it seek to answer? Well, the biggest question was to determine all the finite simple groups. And that was achieved depending on <laughs> what, what, what you think is achieved, uh, either around 1980 or around 25, something like that. There's some disagreement on what's been achieved? No, there's no disagreement on what's been achieved, but uh, claims were made that uh, the classification was complete around 1980, and that turned out not to be correct. What happened? There was a uh, great strategic mathematician, Daniel Gorenstein, who was organized this project and came up with an outline of a, how one should try to prove this classification theorem. And uh, he parceled out problems to various people, and some things were done behind his back. But anyway, eventually he decided that the problem had been achieved. But really what that meant was that in some cases he had confidence that a person he had assigned a problem to and was working on that problem would finish off the problem. In one case, a very hard, long problem, the person didn't finish it off. And as a matter of fact, he eventually stopped working on the problem and started working on something else. And the uh, mathematics world became aware of this, oh, I don't know, 1990, maybe 10 years later or something like that. And it took a while for, to, for people to attack this problem. And, uh, Eventually, around about two, between 2000 and 2005, it was finished off. This problem had, had been left open, a large problem. Now, operating in a pure math environment, have you ever seen your research, either by your own volition or by people who follow your research, apply it to the so-called real world, or is there a, a bright line between the two? Well, it depends what you mean, I think. Depends on what you'd regard as an application and... Uh, well, asking you, what do you regard as an application from pure math? Well, this won't necessarily be about group theory, but uh, let's see. Uh, error correcting codes, you know what an error correcting code is? It's, it's big in quantum computing right now. Yeah, but it'd be a quantum type code, I think. So. But. There's people who are mathematicians who are coding theorists who produce these codes. For example, the uh, one of the early satellites, Voyager, or what's the other one? The one, anyway, one of them, the, the, the communic JPL communicated with this satellite using a famous code, the uh, Golay code. Your uh, Communication. Communication, you want to secu secure communication and you would want an uh, encryption scheme, mm -hmm. encryption and decryption. And there are various schemes like that that use very sophisticated mathematics. The um, one, the, what, what is it? R something A. There's one that uses uh, factorization of integers and the quantum uh, computer was shown by a 
actually was an undergraduate here, not while he was an undergraduate, but while he was working at the Bell Labs probably, that a quantum computer could solve in, in real time this the factor factorizing one of these integers in, in as a product of two primes, and so it's this uh, encryption scheme, if there was a quantum computer, would not be uh, worth anything. So those are two applications. Michael, the word theory. So in a scientific context, of course, a theory is either validated or not experimentally or observationally. How are theories in math validated? Well, I, I don't think that that term would be inappropriate. You have a theory and prove things within that theory. How do you validate the theory? I don't, I'm not even sure what that means from, from the point of view of a mathematics theory. So how then do you know if a theory is right or not? Well, again, the term right is probably not appropriate. The theory is, uh, what I think of as mathematical theory is, is a bunch of uh, concepts, theorems, examples. The theorems, you could say, are, are theorems correct? That you know, would be legitimate, legitimate to ask that question, just like you can ask where the classification of finite simple groups is correct. But say that the theory is correct, and doesn't, it's not really a, a question to ask. I guess maybe a different way is, how do you measure progress in the field? Well, there are important problems that people within the field or even outside the field decide are important, and then if you, you're able to, if people are able to prove those theorems or make progress on the problem, may not demand just a theorem; it might demand interesting examples, counterexamples. If you can produce those things, then that's progress. I see you. You still work on a blackboard, despite having computers all around, it's still important for you to write things out physically. Well, I mean, it's, it's not, you can't really see from, from what's up there, but a lot of what I would would uh, write down would be little pictures, little diagrams and things like that. Uh, would, would can't do that very well on a, on a computer. That does beg the question how computational power, increasing computational power, has been relevant for your research over your career? Or has it not, not very much? Well, it depends what you mean by relevant. I don't, I've never used, well, maybe one time I used a computer. But uh, I sort of don't like using a computer because uh, it, it's a crutch that allows you to solve some problem, computationally solve some problem, whereas if you didn't have that crutch then you'd have to think and hopefully be able to solve the problem because you produced some new points of view, new ideas, so you could have a greater understanding of the problem than if you just solved it or some portion of it using a machine. But in finite group theory, for example, with these finite simple groups, there's some infinite families of these simple groups, and then there's 26 groups that don't seem to fit into any one of the infinite families. They're called sporadic groups. And the way the sporadic groups were discovered over a period, well, Matthew discovered five of them back in the mid-19th uh, century. But in modern times, so, so there's, what, maybe 21 left, and then they started to be discovered about, uh, I mean, 1965, and for about 10 years they were discovered at the rate of about two a year, obviously. So to discover it meant that you, you're working on some problem and you're trying to show that the answer to the problem is perhaps some set of simple groups, and you reach a point where you have something that looks like a simple group. It has, you have some object, some presumably exi existing, may or may not exist object, so some, 
supposedly a simple group, and you start to get build up a bunch of self-consistent information about this thing. And after a certain point in time, if you, you have enough information is proved to, if this thing exists, then the information about it is so-and-so, and, and then it's all self-consistent, then people start to believe, well, there's got to be something here. So at that point in time, this thing was said to be discovered. But now there are two other questions. First, you want to know, well, does it really exist? So there ex there's the existence question. And then you'd like to know, well, a group satisfying these various, prob these various properties is unique, unique up to isomorphism. So that's uniqueness. So there's the existence and the uniqueness problem. And particularly in the early days of, you know, from the period from 65 to 75, Often the existence and uniqueness were uh, uh, established using the machine. But then, for example, they, some of these things started to be so big that they exhausted the uh, power of uh, the computers in, in, at that point in time. And as a matter of fact, the largest one, I, I don't think, think you can still analyze it in any degree using a computer. The computer power isn't, isn't there even yet. What about simulation? Is computer simulation important for your research? For my research, the computer isn't important, but for, for some people, sure. I'm not sure simulation would be the word, but there's group theoretical packages, and lots of people, first thing they think about doing is to plug in input into the, one of the computer packages and see what slides out so they can get some idea about what seems to be true. and then use that to generate conjectures, maybe even beginnings of ideas about how to approach the problem. Michael, another question about progress coming from the vantage point from where I'm more comfortable in the sciences, and that is progress doesn't necessarily mean understanding nature. It just means understanding it at a deeper level of complexity, and you can keep going, and there's probably no end to that progression. In mathematics, is that also the same? That when you achieve a breakthrough, it doesn't necessarily mean that you understand fundamentally the problem. It just raises new questions that couldn't be raised before. Well, probably what you do is understand some some collection of problems in the larger domain that you're studying, say finite group theory. But there's always other questions to ask. So this classification of finite simple groups, we have that, but then you use that to go on and solve problems often from other areas of mathematics. But to do that, just knowing the simple groups isn't enough. You have to know lots of facts about them. And you always want to know more facts. You know, you maybe you think, well, now I know everything that's worth knowing, but then some problem comes along and you see that, that uh, there's extra things that you need to know solve that problem. So in essence, there, there's no end. That in hundred, hundreds of years from now, mathematics mathematicians will still be plugging away. Oh, sure. But what they'll be plugging away will be different than what we're plugging away. Of As course. As a matter of fact, I got my PhD in 69, so I've been working 50 years or so, and mathematics has changed a lot in that 50 years. I can barely recognize it. This is perhaps a, as much a philosophical as it is a mathematical question, but as I'm sure you probably know, many physicists are, um, they are critical of string theory because it's not testable, that it's mm -hmm. right, simply not mathematics, not verifiable. Physically verifiable. That's right. So in mathematics itself, right, how do you know that what you're working on is tethered to reality and it's not just conceptual or is that not the case and it's not a concern on top of that i'd say it's not a concern if if there's if, if it is connected to the real world in some way that's that the real world finds interesting then that's nice because that makes your work more important socially but, useful you mean no someone is judging a piece of mathematics, at least the way I would judge it is, can you do something with it? Is it, can you prove things in other areas of mathematics or perhaps even better, can you uh, use this 
theory that's been built up to, to in a significant way in some real, real world, world problems. That's always a good thing. Yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean that you'll shy away from research if you can't draw those connections oh, either. That's right, sure. How do you tether yourself then? How do you know if it's not connected to physical reality that you're working on stuff that is testable, that's falsifiable? Well, it could very well be tethered to some, to some other areas of mathematics. So it may, just, just as your theory is, it's nice to have your theory say something in the real world, it's nice to have it say something in the mathematical world maybe in some specialty in mathematics that on the surface has no connection to, to your specialty. And if, that, those, if, if you're able to solve a problem that uh, uh, is of interest in the mathematical world, probably meaning that the professors at good math, math, mathematics departments appreciate it, then, uh, uh, then that's that's giving some prestige to your to the to the area of mathematics that you're working in. Michael, if a cosmologist would say that the laws of physics are universal, and a cosmochemist would say that the periodic table is universal, is mathematics universal as well? And some faraway planet, it's the same math. Well, so so this is a or something related is a philosophical problem of mathematics. Are mathematical objects, do they really exist? Are they there or are they, are they discovered, created by the mathematicians that came upon them? And I think you'd find that almost all particularly good mathematicians would answer that they're really, these, these notions really exist. As opposed to being in the, in the abstract of somehow, yeah. but still that they really exist, and so your mathematician on this other planet would be uh, led to the same notions. Meaning that it's more than just a shared psychological construct. Yes. But I guess to go back to the lack of being able to prove a theorem. How do you know? How do mathematicians satisfy themselves that they know these things to be true? Or is that where you bump up against well, the belief? Well, mathematician, or probably these days in particular, a group of mathematicians writes that writes down a proof of the theorem. And the community looks at that proof and eventually either says it's, it's incomplete, it's wrong, so you have to go back to the drawing board, or says, yeah, this proof looks right and then it becomes accepted mathematics. Maybe a more concrete way of asking the question to come back to progress, because you work in so many different areas, when do you achieve particular satisfaction on a problem that you're working on? Either that you can put it away for the time being, or you've done all that you can on it and it's time to work on something else. How do you make those, those decisions? Well, breaking things up into little pieces. You're trying to prove theorems which are uh, just like this guy Gorenstein that came up with a strategy for approaching the classification of the finite simple groups. And now this strategy is composed of proving a bunch of theorems. So if you can prove some important theorem within the context of some over some large strategy about, about how to approach your area of mathematics, and that's, that's an accomplishment. So for me, I would ha get satisfaction if I did that. And at that point in time, I have to decide, do I want to pick out another theorem in this area to work on, or do I want to do something slightly different? A more nuts and bolts, bolts question, not so philosophical, but in the day, a day in the life for a mathematician for you, what does that look like? Are you at the board all day? Is it pen and paper? Are you on the phone? Are you talking to colleagues? What does a day look like for you when you're ensconced in the math? I'm thinking, sitting here at my desk thinking about something, maybe scribbling down a few things on a piece of paper. 
when I have enough scribbles and, then, and they've coalesced into something which seems to be locally complete, then go on my little computer here and type it up and print it out and stick it away and build up enough of these small pieces of work that they go into completing the proof of the major result that I, that I want to want to prove. We'll talk lots about Caltech, but just at the outset, an administrative question. Being here where there isn't a discrete math department, it's the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy, is that meaningful to you at all, that, that administrative distinction? Does that make a difference in terms of how you work, who you interact with? Uh, no, not really. But uh, politically and uh, from the point of view of the department, it makes a difference. Politically meaning how? Well, for example, the division chairman is probably going to be the major person deciding how to allocate resources. The division chairman, chairman, any given one, may or may not be sympathetic to mathematics and allocate what we think is our fair share of resources. So. There's good times and bad times from that point of view. Because you don't need an expensive laboratory to do your work, what are the major budgetary requirements in supporting mathematics? Salaries. And obviously bringing on new faculty. You can't bring on new, new faculty unless the institute is willing to commit the, the salary for that person. And that's going to be made, decision will be made primarily by the division chairman, but also by the uh, provost. And broadly speaking, over your long career at Caltech, how has mathematics been supported in those dollars and cents terms over the years? Not as well as lots of places. Mathematics is, has historically not been uh, a high priority at Caltech, but I don't know, maybe sometime around the mid-70s or something, uh, we, we, the mathematics department, started to develop better strategies and we had better taste than uh, some of the previous uh, faculty had, and so the quality of the department has improved a lot since about that time. Mm -hmm. I've sort of lost track about how it is at, at the moment since I've retired, but over a certain period we are, you know, there's ratings for our, for all departments, physics, chemistry, mathematics, and typically I don't know what we would have been pre-1975, but eventually we sort of got up, at least got up into the top ten rated departments, seven or eight, something like that. Well, Michael, let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning. I'd like to ask about your parents first. Tell me a little bit about them. My parents came from a small town in southern Illinois called Staunton, Illinois. Maybe, maybe I have to modify that. My mother lived, at least when she was a small child in New York, but her mother died, and I'm not sure exactly at what age, or early age, so then she went to live with an aunt and uncle in this small town, Staunton, Illinois, in southern Illinois. What, what would you like to know? What about your father? Where does your father's family come from? From Staunton. How many generations back do they go there? Well, not that many generations. My, my fa father's father, I think, probably was from Staunton. But he, he might have, his father might have immigrated from uh, Europe. I'm not sure. One time I sat down for a day and tried to uh, find s stuff like that out and found that some Oshbachers had come over from don't know where, but they, they were on the boat from La Havre and came to the U.S. And so that, that might have been uh, that side of the family, which I'm not sure. Maybe I've heard from Alsace or Switzerland and the name is not not so uncommon. It's a German name? German or Swiss. Do you know what it means? 
Ashbrook, something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know? No idea. <laughs> What, what was the highest level of uh, education that your parents achieved? Well, my father had a PhD in accounting. He uh, wasn't very ambitious, but he, I think he's probably very smart. Uh, and uh, after leaving high school, maybe he went to some small college and play football, and he, well, he couldn't do that. He had low blood, low blood pressure, so for some period of time up until the beginning of the Second World War, he was working in, in the post office in uh, Springfield, Illinois, the capital of Illinois, and my mother was teaching school. So then the, the uh, Second World War started, so he, he would have been drafted, I guess, but he went, took some exam and got into officer's training school. And my mother was a whack for a while. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, so everybody thinks I'm from Arkansas, but as I recreated, my parents were at an army base in Arkansas, uh -huh. and he might not have been around when I was born, I'm not sure. He, he was in the Pacific, uh, uh, eventually was on Okinawa, so that must have been after the Japanese surrendered. Did he ever talk about his experiences in the Pacific? No. And I never never ask him. I never asked my parents lots of things. It didn't bother me not knowing. But then eventually when I got to be of age, when it started to be interesting, they were dead. I couldn't just, all I had was my own vague memories of what went on. What was your father's career? Did he, did he teach accounting? Yes. When he came back from uh, the war, he uh, went to school at the University of Illinois on the GI Bill and got an undergraduate degree there, probably in business, I guess, because then you know, I assume he got a master's degree at the University of Illinois in accounting and then had to write a thesis, which he wasn't all that uh, interested in doing. But he got a job at Michigan State in East Lansing and eventually wrote the thesis and so I think we went to East Lansing in 53 and then 59 came out here and he got a job. He was a professor of accounting at uh, Cal State Northridge. I don't know if that was because he didn't get tenure in Michigan State or uh, whether he preferred to come to California where he could play golf all the time, which is his major interest at that point. How old were you when the family got to California? Uh, I was, must have been 15 or 16, let's see, he was 59, so what was I, I was born in 44, 15, I guess. And up until that point, you grew up in Illinois? No, S started in Illinois until 53, and 53, we went up to East Lansing, so we lived in a little farming community outside of East Lansing, a community where they were starting to build up a uh, subdivision, American Way, after the war and then came out here in 59. Do you have brothers or sisters? No, I was an only child. Only child. When did it dawn on you or your parents or your teachers that you had mathematical abilities? None of those people would have known what it was meant to have mathematical abilities, you don't. Don't see what mathematics is until you get to university and then probably may not see what it is unless you go to a university that has a good mathematics department. What about your father with his expertise in accounting? Too far afield, too different? It's not mathematics. That's, what would you say, arithmetic? Not even that. Yeah, I guess if you're going to say anything, you'd say arithmetic. Well, there must be some. There's accounting theory, I'm sure, but I doubt it very much is taught. Well, I won't speculate. What kind of high school did you go to in California? Was it a big school? Yes, I went to a big LA City school, James Monroe High School, 3,000 students, three years in the high school, about 1,000 in each class, and, but uh, only a small percentage were in a, a, a track that would lead them to go on to college. 
Were you a strong student in high school? Did you do well? Uh, yes. Not as, not as, I didn't do as well as I should have, but yeah, I was about 10th of my class, maybe something like that. Did you have a sense that, did math come easy to you? Oh, Algebra, everything, calculus? Everything came easy to me. Yeah. School was boring. Did you read outside? Did you study on your own to keep yourself occupied? I read outside, but just genre fiction. I didn't uh, read to improve myself. What about college courses during high school? Did you look for more education that you can get in your high school? No, I didn't. And you said it, your, your parents, your teachers, they wouldn't have had the tools to recognize. Well, there wasn't, I wasn't do, we weren't doing what a mathematician would think of as mathematics. Yeah. So I'll be doing arithmetic and some low level calculus maybe if it, that was one thing that at least the school had is they had a half semester of calculus when I got here after leaving high school. Uh, at Caltech even the majority of the people that came did not have a calculus course so there were two sections of, for people who had some sort of calculus course in high school. So things have changed. Nobody now that is admitted as a student wouldn't have had a calculus course. When it was time to think about college, were you thinking about focusing on mathematics? No. Uh, probably I was thinking I'd probably focus on, on science, but I was actually thinking more in terms of physics and mathematics. But when I got here, I didn't do too well in physics and then didn't feel so comfortable with it, whereas mathematics I was doing well and it, and it appealed to me. Was after you graduated high school, was the draft something you needed to contend with? Eventually, but I was a student, so I had a student deferment until the draft ran and ran until you were 26, so I think I got got out of graduate school when I was 25, so I was, for a year I was uh, draft eligible, but I had a big Los Angeles uh, draft board, so they weren't likely to take some 26-year-old mathematician as they had plenty of other bodies, so anyway, yeah. fortunately I did, I was drafted. Besides Caltech, where else did you apply? Well, you know, I don't really remember completely. I know I applied Was to Caltech Princeton. the dream for you? Is this where no. you always wanted to go? No. I applied to Princeton, that was a place I wanted to go, but they didn't accept me. I applied to MIT, I was accepted everywhere else. MIT, Caltech, must have had some backup, backups in maybe University of California, some branch, I'm not sure, but I, I don't remember. So that left me, the, the two schools that were in the mix were MIT and Caltech, and, and I wanted to get away from home, so I wanted to go to MIT, but my mother had, uh, had cancer in the summer before my senior year and she said she wanted me to not go that far away. She you know, wasn't sure that the cancer would, would not reoccur so I said okay. They might not, <coughs> might not have financed me to any place else so maybe I had to say okay, I'm not sure. But so anyway, that's I ended up at Caltech. Now Princeton, MIT, Caltech, you're making these decisions on some vague notion that you were pursuing a degree in physics. No, not really. I, I'll, I just said physics could be of, of the various sciences that that was the one that somehow most appealed to me, that's all. I had not made a uh, given serious thought to the matter. I wasn't even sure that I would go into science, but coming to Caltech that pretty much Set the set means I meant I was going to go into science. So you arrive in was it sixty two sixty two, and what are some of the classes in physics where you start to say to yourself maybe this is not for me? Well, at Caltech, you you, you presumably understand that there's a core, a core, and in the, in those days, the core was two years of physics, mm -hmm. so it wasn't even a choice of what you're taking. So the physics that I wasn't doing so well in were this two two years of physics, plus there was also, I forget, a year or two of physics lab, mm -hmm. which I probably did even worse. <laughs> worst of all was chem lab. 
<laughs> that didn't work for you. No, I wasn't disciplined enough, attentive enough to detail to, to do well in the laboratory setting. I couldn't have been an experimental physicist, for example. I don't think. <laughs> Was there a specific professor or course where a light bulb went off, where you realized where you belonged in math? Yeah, the my mathematics in my freshman year, like I say, there were these two special sections. That, but it turned out it was lousy to be in those special sections because, you, you, for example, the instructor in, in our section was an aeronautical engineer, a, a, uh, I think he was a grad student, as a matter of fact, not even a postdoc. So that wasn't so great. But so then my sophomore year, I took two mathematics courses, the introductory algebra course and the introductory analysis course, and uh, had pretty good instructors. As a matter of fact, my instructor in the uh, analysis course was Donald Knuth. You know, you know him. Yeah. So he was a student of Marshall Hall, who was the biggest name in the mathematics department at that time. And Hall got him hired as an assistant professor, I guess. And he, what I, the way I've heard, he probably would have stayed, but he wanted to uh, consult and make extra money. And Caltech in those days wouldn't let people consult, so he said. And he left and went up to Stanford. But he, he was a very interesting instructor. And, and the other guy was a pretty good Lee algebraist. He was less exciting, but the course was interesting. So I did well in those two courses and enjoyed them. And I'd already said I was going to be a mathematics major because I wasn't going to be a physics major or a chem major. <laughs> what were some of the exciting ideas in mathematics during your time as an undergraduate? What were the professors working on? Well, the professors here probably weren't, most of them weren't working on things that were too exciting. Marshall Hall was, he, he worked in combinatorics and, and the group theory, both finite and infinite. And at this point in time, uh, finite group theory was starting to take off. So that was probably the most interesting thing that was going on here at that time. Was Caltech considered a leader in this field at the time? No, I would say not, but, well, it depends what you mean. Was it an intellectual center for the field? Yes, as long as you allow yourself to go down the number of universities for intellectual centers, but sure. Marshall was here, and uh, eventually he collected some instructors that were uh, group theorists too, including me and David Whale. Were some of the physicists catching on to group theory? Well, you hear, um, what is it, the Eightfold Way, Gelman's thing? Yeah. It's always described as being b based on groups, but what, what it's really based on is Lie algebras. There's a Lie algebra, which is another algebraic object and has an, an associated group with it, but I think to the extent that I know anything about particle physics, which is not at all. I think really that it's the, the algebra that they're using. But it's algebraic objects that are related to, uh, to, uh, to groups, and indeed to finite groups. These simple algebraic groups are passed down from them to the finite groups. Do you have a sense, were you particularly strong in your classes? Did the professors single you out or recognize that you, you could, you had the ability to go on to graduate school? Oh, certainly go on to graduate school. I mean, almost everybody. I mean, I read something about, you know, you, you gave me your two, um, two uh, talks that you had had with the people, and, you, and at least one of them, the notion arose that the undergraduates were much stronger than the graduate students. Well, it was even worse for Mathematics, there were probably a few graduate students that were uh, equal to the undergraduates, but that, that's a, that was about it. So, I mean, anybody that was a decent undergraduate here could go on to graduate school uh -huh. if they wanted to. I was one of the better ones. But, for example, let's see, there was a guy named Fern Poitras who uh, I think won the Putnam exam at least one year, so he was probably would have been thought of as the best student. And then there was 
myself and Richard Stanley, and both of us went on to have very good careers in mathematics. Poitras went on and if you win the Putnam exam, you become a Putnam fellow, so your way is paid at Harvard if you want to go there. And he went there, but he went to divinity school, not, <laughs> not the mathematics program. Now, you said as an undergraduate, that's when you decided on pure math to focus on. Yeah. Was it a specific class? Was it just a general sense that you enjoyed it? This is what you were good at? Well, you had to declare a major, so I declared a mathematics major as opposed, opposed to applied mathematics major. I assume there was an applied mathematics major at that time. So that when, when you, uh, because of the fact that there's so, in those days it was even worse, so many core courses, you uh, almost have to take a, uh, the introductory courses in whatever specialty or discipline you're working in early on in your sophomore years so that you can build up the background to, uh, to take graduate courses your junior year and senior year and can get out with uh, some decent background. So what I took was, the mathematics courses I took were two introductory courses in pure mathematics. Does the focus on pure mathematics coupled with the decision to go to graduate school does that put you on a professional track where if you're successful you'll end up being a professor or are there other career options to consider? Well, at the, t at the time, there are certainly other career options to consider, but at the time, that the, back in when I was, like I graduated in 69, that was a little before the job market turned sour. Mm -hmm. So the job market was pretty good then. You could, if you... 69 was thesis. the PhD, 66 was 66 the bachelor's. Was my bachelor's, yeah. yes. But getting into graduate school, that's nothing coming from, from Caltech. Right. Although the University of Wisconsin was, after Berkeley, was probably the best uh, public university in the country at that time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I've lost track. What was I, what were we talking about? About career trajectories, about sure. what things you can do. So in those days, it was easy to go on and, and uh, to become an academic if you got a PhD in mathematics. It might be a little harder to, to be a, go to a good research university. As a matter of fact, it would be harder, but a, a decent research university you'd probably, you could probably go to now. You might have run into the the bad job market about the time that uh, that I got out, so you might have had some difficulties getting tenure. But at least for a lot of people, that was certainly the academic uh, life was was one viable uh, alternative. But you could go to go to work for uh, uh, in the aerospace industry out here. You could. I don't know, there must have been lots of things. I mean, in, in later days, there's more now, you know, in computer science, statistics, finance. Some of those things weren't available when, when I was got out of school, but I was thinking in terms of being an academic anyway. You Did see, you? my father didn't, didn't have to work real hard. Yeah. Did you have a senior thesis at Caltech? No, Caltech didn't have senior thesis, but they did have a, a competition so I wrote a paper for that competition. What was the paper? Name of the paper. It was a, it was a paper in combinatorics. I forget what the title would have been. What was the advice about graduate school that you received? Is it better to stay? Is it better to go? No, you, it's not. It wasn't good to stay here. We're too small. So you probably exhausted the uh, uh, the resources uh, if you taken a lot of courses as an undergraduate. You know, in special cases, it might, you'll want to work with somebody, somebody here that you, can, you couldn't work with somebody comparable anywhere else, well, maybe, but you were counseled to, to go someplace else. What were the top programs in the country? Where, did, where were you considering? Well, I'm not sure I really knew what the top programs were in the country, and I didn't uh, uh, apply to the top programs. <laughs> uh, well, in those days, Harvard, Berkeley, Princeton, Chicago, 
probably MIT and maybe those were, and it's pretty much the same thing these days, except Stanford is in the mix. Did you apply to all of them? No, no, I didn't apply to any of them. I had come here to this small science-oriented institution. I wanted to go to some different sort of institution. I wanted to go to a big public university where there was different things going on. So the best of those universities, the one that, that I was wanted to go to and I could have got in, didn't have to worry, was uh, Berkeley. But Marshall Hall didn't want to, didn't want me to go to Berkeley. What was his he issue said, with he Berkeley? He said he wouldn't write a letter of recommendation. I think he probably would have if I pressed him, but he said it was just, the department was too big, you'd, you, you'd get lost in the mix and everything. So anyway, the, 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 my estimation of the situation was that the second best place amongst big public universities was uh, Wisconsin, so I went there. And it had the virtue of uh, having uh, this guy, Bruck, who... Richard Bruck. Richard Bruck, yeah. Who, uh, Did you know him by reputation even yeah. before you arrived? Sure, yeah. What was Bruck known for? Uh, a certain type of combinatorics and non-associative algebra. And that's specifically what you wanted to focus on? The combinatorics. I didn't know anything about non-associative algebra. Strangely enough, later on I did a little work in it, but at that time I didn't. On the social side of things, Madison must have been pretty interesting in the late 1960s. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got there first day walking around the university and the police were pushing the crowds back, came to see what was happening, and they set off tear gas. People were running around the university trying to escape from the tear gas. Were you politically involved no. at all? No. The, I don't know if you ever, this is probably too old for you to know about, but uh, right next to the mathematics building was, I forget what the hell do they call it, Anyway, some small building that, that was devoted to uh, Army research, or at least Defense Department research. And uh, somebody set off a bomb in the, uh, this place. Only I think that it was next to the computer, and the computer was someplace else, and people were killed with the bomb, and for example, I. I lived with, uh, roomed with some astronomers, and one of the astronomers had his thesis in this computer. Stellar, his thesis was on stellar interiors, and he lost his thesis. Oh, no. Oh, no. But, of course, even worse for the people that were killed in the explosion. Tell me about Richard Bruck as a person. Did you work closely with him? No. I had a problem I was working on when I was an undergraduate here and I worked with it and solved it, took it to him my second year. He wanted me to do some more so I did some more and I had to you know I had to stick around for the three years anyway. And I went to his seminar. He was a nice guy, but how much of the curriculum is coursework and how much is it just you working independently? Where? At at, at Wisconsin. Oh at Wisconsin? Well, uh, you had to take a certain number of courses that were, unless you were, you, 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 maybe if, I, if I'd stayed around longer, I could have escaped some of the courses, but you had to take courses and you had to pass qualifying exams. So for, for me, I always took two or three courses in, in each term and that left plenty of time to, to do work intellectually being at a bigger school, bigger department, in what ways were you exposed to new areas of mathematics? Well, you had to take some courses to, and, and uh, pass these qualifying exams, but most of the, uh, most of what I needed to know in my qualifying exams I had encountered here as an undergraduate. And then I took them the first year or so, the end of the first year or so, and it wasn't, uh, it hadn't, I hadn't forgotten them by then, so I was in fairly good shape. Uh, and then I was more free to t 
take what I wanted to. For example, one thing about the, being at a big university like that, reasonably good university, is they have visiting professors. So I think my first year, or yeah, my first year, uh, one, one of two years, I took a course in infinite groups from a guy named uh, Bertram Neumann, who is an excellent infinite group theorist. And uh, the other year, I took a course from uh, Helmut Wieland, who was uh, German, obviously, and was at time, that time thought of as one of the excellent finite group theorists. He wasn't, but he was thought of that way. So I was exposed to this this uh, some some group theory taught by good people, and then the third quarter, it was the, the two people I went to work with in Illinois were Michio Suzuki and John Walter, and Suzuki had a student that came to Madison. I think probably my third year. I'm not sure, but anyway, that's when I became aware of him, and he taught a course out of. Uh, uh, mimeograph version of Gorenstein's book, this guy Gorenstein that I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. So he, Gorenstein wrote a book that had modern, it was a modern finite group theory. And uh, so uh, this guy, Bauman, caught the, taught the course out of this, these notes of Gorenstein, which really interested me. It was very pretty stuff. And uh, he probably got me the job at, uh, Bauman, I mean, got me the job at uh, Illinois, my year of postdoc before I came here. But living in Champaign Urbana was not my idea of a fun time. <laughs> what did you work on for your thesis research? Uh, a certain type of symmetric block design. And the big, the, the big result was uh, constructing a new uh, symmetric block design of this particular sort. The largest one, still the largest one known, but it's not like discovering a sporadic group. How long was your thesis? Fifty pages. Is that about average size for mathematics? Yeah, yeah sure. And how much of it is the equations, and how much of it is prose? You explaining what you found? Well, it's. You would you would say that most of it is prose, but it's not explaining what what I found. There's probably some introduction where I'm trying to make what I did look good, but a proof in mathematics is basically it, it's English. And what did you find? What were the conclusions of your research? That there existed a, a symmetric block design of certain type, but then to to have found it. I had to have some body of theory which would lead me to, you know, this thing didn't pop out by accident. So also part of the thesis was developing this theory of automorphism groups of symmetric block design. So I, already I was dealing with finite groups there. To the extent that there are fashions or fads in mathematics, was this a hot time for this area of research? <coughs> Depends what you mean by a hot time. For this area of research, it's probably... Were there lots of people working on it uh, alongside you? Yeah, but it still wasn't a central area of mathematics. There was a fair number of people, particularly in Germany. Bruck had worked on these finite geometries. Uh, some of his students worked on that. Was there an oral defense? Uh, gee, was there? Probably, but I don't remember. It's probably good. It was uneventful. <laughs> You'd remember. Well, I don't think I had to worry about defending my thesis. Besides Bruck, were there other professors at Madison you were close with? No. As a graduate student, you could really work on your own. Well, Breck, with Breck you could. I don't know about, like I say, uh, the biggest part of my thesis was uh, I did before I even knew him. So, but then 
I became a member of his research group and he had a weekly seminar and uh, I got to know him a little bit better. Is a postdoc standard after the PhD in math? It is now. In those days, I don't think it was, no. Were you on the job market and that was simply the best offer at the time, Illinois? I was on the job market because I you know, was going to graduate. And I didn't apply very many places. I applied to Caltech. I liked, liked living in Pasadena and Marshall Hall was here. I applied to Berkeley probably. Probably the only reason I applied to Illinois was Bauman. Uh, I guess I wouldn't have known that uh, there was a job available. And so uh, I don't, to be truthful, remember exactly where I applied, but uh, th this was the, might have been the only uh, job that, 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 the, that I was accepted for. It was a funny type of postdoc. Uh, it was only six thousand dollars. So a year later, when I came here as an instructor, I think the salary was eleven thousand. But I didn't have to do anything. So in that sense, it was good. It was probably better to have the six thousand dollars and not have to teach than it would have been to have a. Besides the Illinois, it wouldn't have only been one course. It would have been more than one course. Yeah. Were you were you happy to come back to Caltech? Yes. Like I say, well, I, you know, I was lived part of my early life in Champaign-Urbana, but later on, I wasn't so pleased to live there. It was good to be back in Pasadena. Yeah. What was your work? What were you working on when you arrived back at Caltech at that point? Well, I was working on permutation groups. Marshall Hall thought I was working, thought I was going to be the combinatorics instructor. We, he had, David Wales was here at the time. He was supposed to be the group theory instructor. But I wasn't that interested in the combinatorics. Some of the group theory problems I worked on had combinatorial uh, associations. And how did you become involved in the classification of finite simple groups? Well, Hall had a seminar, and he was, the, the, the seminar was going over uh, papers on sporadic groups. And there was a visitor named uh, John Mackay, and he had a mimeographed copy of a preprint by, some, by a person named Bern Fischer. German math, mathematician in Bielefeld that was groundbreaking, very novel, and in, and in it, Fisher discovered three new sporadic groups. So I was assigned that paper, and uh, the way I read it was there were some tricks that he had that could be extended to a a much more general situation. So uh, I, I took that as a problem to see if I could determine the groups that satisfied this gen more general property, and I was able to do that. And that turned out to be uh, uh, important for the classification. And I started going to meetings where those people went to and already knew a little bit about it from working with Walter and Suzuki. But you were somewhat outside of this field initially. Oh yes. Sure. The insiders were people that worked with the there was a new there were new tech there's a new technique introduced by a guy named John Thompson called local group theory. And the the people that were proving most of the good theorems were proving using local group theory. And so those were the graduate students of the good local group theorists like Thompson and Feit and Gorenstein. Suzuki was such a person that the year I was there, he was, so was Walter, but Suzuki was writing a book, a textbook, so he wasn't all that accessible. And Walter was 
well known to be a terrible communicator, a very nice guy, and he had good ideas, but he couldn't write them down. In what ways did you have to play catch up in this field, coming from the outside? Well, I had to learn the basics, but I learned them pretty fast, so I never felt at a disadvantage. What were some of the overall goals of classifying finite simple groups? Well, you have some objects that are in some finite simple groups, and you want to prove that those are all of them. You want to prove that each one of these things exists and is unique up to isomorphism. And moreover, if you have any finite simple groups, it's on this list of groups. Now, this is a little difficult because, remember, during this period, a couple of new groups are being discovered every year, but that's okay. You can somehow work that into the mix. I should say that it's important to know what these things are, not just from the point of view of uh, having something to work, work toward proving, but because the proof works inductively. So you consider a finite simple group that's of minimal order subject to not being on your list of groups, and that has the nice consequence that any finite simple group that's properly involved in this potential group is on the list. And if you know things about the groups on the list, then you can use that knowledge to help in your proof. As a matter of fact, you, that's the only way you have a chance of doing anything unless you come up with some brilliant idea which isn't out there. So that's what, they, that's what the, the program was. And the, the most important part of it, the, most, the part that's most problematic is if you're given a simple group, why does it look like one of these groups that you know about? I mean, what does it even mean to look like them? What properties, what general nice properties do these simple groups share that are useful in your, in your proof? Tell me about the Duluth Conference. The Duluth Conference? This is where you were presenting your findings. Actually, George Globerman was presenting his findings, but there were the National Science Foundation uh, in those days and presumably still funded meetings. And the, the typ typical meeting that they would fund, it, there would be a principal speaker and then some small group of established mathematicians. And so the meeting would consist of talk, a series of talks by the uh, principal speaker and maybe one talk by each of the supporting mathematicians, and then there would be a bunch of graduate students or postdocs that would sit out there and take notes and uh, learn stuff. So that's what this Duluth meeting was, and the principal speaker was George Gloverman, an important figure in the field, and uh, I was one of the uh, other people. What clicked for you in this field? What was how, how, how do you understand your success in, in being able to accomplish all of these things? Does it come from combinatorics? Yeah, in part. For example, I mentioned this thing about Fisher's paper. And the, the I, Fisher was using combinatorial ideas. He didn't know any local group theory. He used some combinatorial ideas and he used a little, some, some facts about small, uh, file groups, uh, whatever those are. So in this more general setting, you lost the ability to use the information from the file group, but you, turns out you could keep the combinatorics. So I put together the combinatorics with a little bit of local group theory, whatever I, I knew at the time, which turned out to be enough to, to solve this problem that I was uh, working on. And more generally, Often, I think, having this c coming from this combinatorial background it gave me a different viewpoint, which I think probably was uh, advantageous too. But one important thing was this this theory of local this local group theory was was new. So 
the old timers like Marshall Hall and Beeland wouldn't have known anything about it anyway. So I wasn't really at a, much of a disadvantage vis-a-vis, -vis. I was young and willing to learn. Maybe the students of some of the good local group theorists had a slight advantage, but after a few years that disappeared. What are the overall goals in the classification? What are you trying to achieve? You're trying to prove the theorem that this list of groups is the, the list of all finite simple groups. And when you have that, then you, you take some group. What, is, what does it mean to be a simple group? Well, it means you can't break it down into two smaller pieces, whatever that means. So if you have a general finite group, if you know all the simple groups, then in theory you know, know this group. You, you're, well, that's not true, but anyway, there's, you break it up into pieces which are simple groups, and then there's an extension problem which asks you to paste together these groups. And how, what ways can you do that? Well, it turns out there's just too many ways to do that. It's not feasible to try to classify all finite groups because this extension problem is too complex. But what seems to be the case, what works out surprisingly often is if you have a problem involving some finite group, you can reduce it down to a problem about maybe not a simple group, but something that's very close to a simple group. So if you know the simple groups and you know the right properties that those groups have, then you can say something about this group which arises in some context. On the question of complexity, how do you convey these ideas so that your colleagues understand what you're talking about, given the fact that these are such difficult concepts to understand? Well, the way Gorenstein did it was to say, well, this proof of this theorem involves thousands of pages. Maybe he said 10,000, hundreds of mathematicians took years to do, that was a measure of the complexity of the problem. These require books. These are not just papers. Hundreds of papers or some books, too. I, Michael Atiyah, a great mathematician, held a uh, meeting in London on, under the auspices of the Royal Society on proof. And basically, I think the the, uh, the real reason for it was what you were talking about, computer-aided proofs. But another, what I talked about was exactly this this fact that th th here's a, here's a theorem that is terribly complex, which whose proof is very, very long, it involves very lots of people. Is this proof really correct? Well, the answer is no, it can't possibly be correct. There's going to be all sorts of local errors, but what you expect is that these local errors will be small and you, you can correct them more or less immediately locally. Now, these days, there's theories of computer-aided proofs, and somebody will probably try to, to write out a, the, this proof in, in the right language and, and use the machine to verify it. And no doubt it will, will discover uh, patches where uh, it's not so easy to, to fill in the details, but I think there's enough robustness in the, in the proof and what's gone afterwards that it's probably correct. But I wouldn't bet my large amount of money in, on the non-existence of any more sporadic groups, for example. Tell me about your time at the Institute for Advanced Study in the late 70s. What do you want to know? Why'd you do it? Why'd you take the sabbatical? Just a change of scenery? Uh, Burrell who was one of the members of the Institute at that time, ran a year on finite simple group theory. So that meant that he was inviting a certain 
sort of like a super, one of these NSF things. So he invited some core group of simple group theorists and then to, who stayed there the year or some large fraction of the academic year there and then brought in other people, lots of other people for shorter periods of time. Did you enjoy the intellectual atmosphere there? Yeah, sure. Well, like I say, I tend to more work on my own. So it was a mixed blessing. It's nice to hear all the talks and to talk to the people and everything, but on the other hand, it also means that you people try to take take a certain amount of your time also. So it was a mixed blessing. Was the Cole Prize the first major award you won? Yes, that's right. What did it feel like to get to get the Cole Prize? Felt very good. <laughs> Validation of your work in some sense. The mathematical community thinks that some portion of the work was good. What kind of administrative service did you do at Caltech? I was executive officer for mathematics for three years in the 90s. And, uh, Is that sort of like a quasi-department chair, if math was a department? It's, it's, it's exactly like a department chair, except the uh, lots of duties are done at the division level, not at the uh, uh, department level. So for example, uh, salaries are determined at the division level, which is good if you're executive officer, you don't get in trouble with somebody because their salary isn't what they'd like to be. Did you take on a lot of graduate students? I never took on a lot of graduate students. I had graduate students most years initially, as long as there was sufficient activity and that in things I was working on at a high enough level so that the, if I had a good graduate student, they could get a good first job. But it reached a point, maybe in the 90s or something like that, that there weren't any members, faculty members at good, good American universities that could, who would work to, to get one of my good graduate students. For example, when my last graduate student was at, came from China, Beijing University, he was on their Olympiad team and he was very quick and wrote a good thesis. And uh, normally, the only person who was left at that point in time at a good university was Walter Fite at Yale. But uh, he couldn't, I, well, there was a couple of people at Chicago. Anyway, he went to, to Chicago Circle, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and uh, accepted the job there. And then, then unfortunately, something like a week later, job turned up. I can't remember whether it was Yale or Chicago, but it might not have turned up. So he spent, he spent his year, at a year at uh, Chicago Circle, and then uh, his wife got pregnant, had a high tech job in San Francisco, and he went there and then eventually started his own hedge fund. When did you first meet Stephen Smith? Well, he was an instructor here in the mid seventies. And is he that? Uh, actually, I probably met him before then. He was a student at Oxford. He and John Hall were students at Oxford with Graham Higman. And uh, I, you know, I would pass through Oxford at that point in time fairly frequently, and I'm sure I must have seen him there. Actually, I was Hall's de facto advisor. And is Stephen Smith that rare person where you did find opportunity to collaborate, not just work on your own? Oh yeah, we collaborated on this quasi thin thing. It took five years approximately. And what is it either about Stephen or the problem that compelled you to collaborate and not, not work alone? Well, it's such a big problem. What's, what's the problem? Why is it so big? Asking 
to classify a certain subclass of the finite simple groups part of, well, it wasn't exactly what Gorenstein wanted, but related to, to, uh, to what Gorenstein wanted. So these quasi-thin groups are, have a certain property. And this is a class of groups that Gorenstein thought was being done by this guy at Santa Cruz, and he wasn't. So that th this was an important chunk of the classification. People were getting restive. Sarah was saying bad things. So we, I had worked on similar things. I'd worked on some problems, subclass of this class called thin groups. And there were certain classes of arguments that one would use to approach this problem that I was familiar with. So I recruited Steve to work with me. He wasn't familiar with these things, but he learned. And most of the uh, time, the, the actually doing the mathematics probably only took a couple of years. Most of the time was writing it up. Mm -hmm. I have a certain style, and he has a certain style, and they weren't too close. And so we'd fight it out, and the style that emerged, I think, was a, a good, uh, good compromise. And what was the division of labor? Did you each do everything and then double checked, or you did some things and Stephen did other things? We worked on parts of the problem and communicated about those parts of the problem. It wasn't as if he went went off somewhere and proved something here and I proved something there. It was more that we We had, a, we had a picture of how we wanted to proceed a strategy, and uh, we proceeded through that strategy. Given the size of the project, how did you know when you were done? What, what was the concluding point? Well, it depends what you mean by done, but we knew, we knew that maybe two years or something, we knew that what left to be done was something that we could do. These significant obstacles had been overcome. What new work was possible as a result of this work, this collaboration? Well, this completed the classification. Yeah. So uh, all the things that you need the classification for, they became real. How do you define real in this context? Well, what I meant was people were just assume the classification was true even though they knew that the proof wasn't complete for for many years. I'm not sure, I don't remember how, how many years, but 10, 15? Mm -hmm. Michael, is the association with the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Science, do you look at these as simply professional honors or are they useful in terms of meeting people and, and, and being involved in that intellectual atmosphere? No, I don't think that, at least in my limited experience, I, the latter is not the case. But there's something in the former, besides being an honorary society, it, you also uh, gives you a chance, I don't, don't take that chance, but gives you a chance to service in uh, mathematics and more generally in science. Are there decadal type surveys in mathematics, the way that the academy does that for the sciences, where there's a review of the field every 10 years, or something similar to that, some kind of analog to that? I don't know. I've never encountered such a thing, but is there it'd be anything surprising if there weren't? Yeah, I'm curious if there's any sort of um, systematic effort to sort of take the overall temperature of the field every decade or five years or whatever it might be. Yeah, I'm not aware of such a thing. For math mathematicians, it might be difficult. Who would undertake this? Would they... That would be performing a service, for example. <laughs> if, if the, uh, the way things work, the uh, the... I assume it's the same for each section, but for the mathematics section, there's somebody that manages the section for a period of, I don't know, two, three years, something like that. 
I suppose such a per person could appoint a committee, but. It does beg the question, how do you keep tabs on what's happening in the field? How do you know that what you're working on is not redundant or it's already been done? Is it conferences? Is it papers? How do you keep abreast of what your colleagues are doing? Well, for somebody in my position, it's, it's just automatic. Email, conferences, rumor. But a bigger question is keeping track of uh, things that are going on in, in other disciplines. That's important too. Well, it can be important mathematically, but for example, one place it's important is if, if you're trying to hire people, which of course we always are. You have to know who is likely to, who has done something that's important and maybe more important than that, who is likely to continue doing important work. What are they, uh, what's their situation, their current situation? Are they likely to be movable for some reason? Do they have a spouse or a girlfriend or something like that? that has to be accommodated uh, and some people are tuned into that stuff I'm not but uh, at least well, virtually my whole career here I've been on the committee that hires people and looks for people to hire and, and to do that you have to read all the letters that can, that uh, letters of recommendation and then can learn a lot by doing that even in a field that uh, is far from your own field simply by knowing people, the letter writers, and having some sense about whether you can believe them or not, and where you can believe them and where you can't, and so on and so forth. Beyond the letters, what do you look for in assessing whether somebody's going to have a successful academic career in mathematics? What are some of the, the human qualities or characteristics that you see? Well, you don't necessarily see them. <laughs> Hard work, quickness. What about intuition? How important intuition, is intuition? Yeah. Oh, very important, yeah. But hard to measure. Whereas hard work is, you know, it's a little bit easier to get your hands on that. Accomplishment. You have somebody in your faculty, or you can talk to somebody whose opinion you trust and get some sense of what they've accomplished. And how the young person, the, the way we got start to raise the quality of our department was to use a strategy whereby we would identify young people and offer them tenure jobs, occasionally tenure track jobs. But if they were good enough tenure jobs before the normally the the, uh, the other university, particularly the very good universities, would uh, would uh, be willing to, to do. So we would get some very good young people. Of course, the downsize was that as soon as they got to a point where their reputations were established, often Harvard or Princeton or somebody like that would hire them away. But at least we had some good young people for some period of time in their career, often maybe the most important time. And the attraction would be more prestige or salary or be just tenure. wanting to be in a tenure. Yeah. But what if they already had tenure here? Not here. We're trying to we're talking about trying to hire somebody as has a faculty position or as a postdoc or a, uh -huh. a graduate student even. Get them to come to Caltech. But I'm asking generally, has has losing faculty been an issue for the math for, for Turnover math faculty? has been, yes. It has been. Yes, for sure. How has PMA dealt with that over the years? Well, it depends on who's the division chairman. If if it's a division chairman who's sympathetic to mathematics and realizes what's going on, then they let us, for example, make more offers than some other division chairman might. 
the rationale being, and the rationale is carried out by ex from experience that you're trying to hire very good people. You maybe make three offers and you might get one acceptance. So if the only thing you can do is to hide, make one offer for each position that's open, then you're going to have difficulties getting good people. Michael, on the undergraduate side, what, what have been your favorite courses to teach undergraduates? Well, I haven't taught many recently. I Over the course of your career, I mean. Well, recently I taught the, uh, the uh, core course in linear algebra. There's two uh, branches of this course. The, the one I teach is the more mathematical. And then I teach, uh, so I teach three courses a year. So one of them would be this one, one this freshman course for one term, and then the other two terms, either uh, the uh, undergrad introductory undergraduate algebra course or the introductory graduate algebra course. Now, when I was younger, and it made sense, I would teach group theory course every once in a while. Sometimes, the you know the faculty needed. Something special. I once taught, taught an algebraic geometry course, which I knew nothing about, but had a decent textbook, so I could could do it. There was a period when I think when probably when I was executive officer, as a matter of fact, and the uh, just before then, the uh, core courses had been taught by older faculty members that weren't too active, but they were retiring about this time, so we needed to get bodies to teach these courses, which were not courses that people wanted to teach. So maybe the first year I cracked the whip and managed to get bodies to fill these courses, but after that, I didn't want to, it was too unpleasant, so I, at least one of the courses I taught myself, so I taught one of these introductory uh, math one or math two. We did that maybe a couple of years. The demography of Caltech has changed very much, certainly since you've been an undergraduate, students coming from all over the world. Do you see any particular value or are there cultural influences that students bring from other countries that have been a value to math here at Caltech? Sure. The, the cultural affinity for mathematics or more generally in, in the intellect. Americans don't seem to, to have that. So our students are either the good students are usually either uh, come from abroad, immigrants, or their perhaps their uh, parents were immigrants or great grandparents. And they still have the immigrant values. Also, the uh, some countries, China in particular. Funnels, identifies and funnels our students into a small number of places so it's easy, easier to identify the, uh, and have some confidence that if you accept a student from one of those places, either an undergraduate or a graduate student, that they're going to be good. So when we, for example, are, you have to decide which ones are going to be good. So in the uh, graduate program, for example, when we came up with a short list of Chinese students we were considering, we wouldn't make the decision. Our, gra our graduate students who were, who were from China would make the decision because they know what the letters meant. I mean, often, I'm not sure it's true anymore, but in those days, the, uh, the letter would be written by the student and then maybe read by the uh, professor who was supposed to have written it. Have you come across undergraduates in your teaching career that just blew you out of the water, that their intellect was really something special to behold? Have you had that opportunity? I wouldn't put it in such strong terms, but I've certainly, almost every 
class in the uh, the undergraduate or graduate algebra course, there are people that are very strong. You can tell that they're not, if they choose, they would have no difficulty going on and having very successful, successful careers as mathematicians. What do those attributes look like? Is it quickness? Well, the homework's always perfect. The exams are almost always perfect. That's, in some cases, I, uh, you know, the surf program? No. The undergraduate, it's a summer. The oh, oh, is, yes, yeah, the, yes. So some, for most of my time here, I've, every summer I've had a surf student, often a, a very good student from one of these classes. So I give them some problem to work on and suggest some ways to approach a problem. And some of them do extremely well, some don't. It's hard to tell and the, the ones that don't, whether it's, lack of uh, smarts or because they don't work hard enough. I think usually it's the hard, not working hard enough. Michael, recently before you retired, you were recognized with a, a, a slate of honors. It was the, the, the Ralph Schock Prize, the Leroy Steele Prize, and the Wolf Prize, all in 2011, 2012. Do you have a sense of why all of this recognition came in such a clustered way around this time? I think it might have had something to do with this quasi-thin uh, uh, work. So that came, I think it was published early 2000s. And it takes a while for, for that to percolate through the system, I think. And what was it about your work, the quasi-thin work, that, that was so impactful in the field? Well, it, like I say, it uh, uh, filled this large gap in the proof. But I'd already proven lots of big results, maybe not quite that big, but comparable results. But of course, back in the 70s, and the 70s are too far in the past. To <laughs> to affect such, uh, such awards, I think. When you get these awards, is there opportunity to give a public address? In the case of the Wolf Prize, it's not only an opportunity, but a demand. A number of public addresses. One of them was a, uh, a short, short talk aimed at uh, high school students, I forget what short meant, five minutes or something on what you'd done, which, you did, which was impossible, of course, for a mathematician. So I did something, but I don't think it worked. And is the goal to, to speak at a technical level or for a more broad audience? Well, and this, this thing that I just mentioned to high school students, that, oh, what could you do? expose them to the problem and give them some sense of what it's about. But for a, math, a mathematics problem, impossible. And I don't, uh, in the other cases, I don't remember anything addressed to a general audience, general audience of mathematicians. <laughs> okay. Michael, an overall question about enrollment. In the way that you fell into mathematics, not really knowing that that's what you wanted to do when you started, what, what is the best means to capture the imagination of undergraduates, so many of whom nowadays, for example, might go into computer science because that's where perhaps the lucrative opportunities are? How has the enrollment in math changed over the years? And what efforts have you and your colleagues made to affect those enrollment numbers? I'm not sure me and my colleagues have done anything, but the community at large has, uh, basically to expose people to uh, what I would call real mathematics. The Russians did a very good job of that back when they were still the Soviet Union. They would uh, have 
here they're called mass circles. Maybe that's a translation of what the Russians called them. Those little, little groups that very good professional mathematicians would meet with uh, once a week or once a month. And so they would see real mathematics, which had the, the beauty and the, uh, the rigor that was demanded. And if for some people, that is so appealing. And for me, for example, I'm, before I discovered mathematics, I was bored most of my life. And then found these problems to work on, and it's just extremely enjoyable. And, and in my experience, the the, uh, the better mathematicians all feel the same. So if you can find somehow introduce somebody somebody to to this real mathematics, then at least some percentage of the ones that have some talent will will be captured. You use the word beauty. Where do you see the beauty? Well, if you, if you can do something, prove something that's important or un, unexpected, and do it simply, or maybe even, maybe it doesn't have to be that simple, but the somehow the argument flows and at each step is simple, then that's attractive. When you went emeritus, having shed administrative responsibilities, did that give you an opportunity to be more productive in certain ways? No, I don't think so. Just allocated my time differently. Probably allocated it more or less the same amount of time to research, and but the time that was spent with teaching or committee work was went somewhere else. Now that you're a a senior scholar in your field, how do you compare the energy that comes with youth versus the wisdom that comes with age? How do you apply those as they relate to doing the math? By wisdom, maybe wisdom means having seen all sorts of different problems and so that uh, if you encounter something that harkens back to something you know, that can be an advantage. I'm not sure I would use the word wisdom and to describe that. I think the, the drive and the, uh, the, uh, the newness of is something that comes from youth and that's uh, that that's an advantage over over the older mathematician are there mistakes that you would have made 30 or 40 years ago that you wouldn't make today as a way of coming to the idea of wisdom or acquired knowledge or however you might understand it yes that's probably true but not for the reasons you say the, the reason is that uh, like many mathematicians, I had, had a very uh, sparse style, left out details and uh, it was hard to read my mathematics. It's hard for me to go back and read it sometimes. But the, my experience with Steve, he, he was just the opposite. He was very careful and very attentive to detail. So he would write something up, and in a sense, it's more readable. But in another sense, it's not so readable because if you if you know each the proof is you can think of as broken up into little packets, and if you can look at a packet and say, "I know how to do that," then you don't have to read the packet. So if you break things down like that, then it can be for the, for the right per person, the person that, that knows how to fill in these details. It can be easier to read than the, than the proof that has all sorts of details, many of which for some people would be felt to be extraneous. They're necessary to the argument formally, but 
and you know that division comes someplace all the time. It's just the, it's a matter of taste where it, where it comes. But so so I, I had my style. Steve had his style. When we both wrote this stuff up, we had a compromise, which I think was the best of both worlds, and it taught me to appreciate uh, more detailed proofs. And if you have more details, you include more detail, you're less likely to to make small errors. It can also be more comprehensible to your readers. And yes, that too. But I worried about that less than the But you do need your colleagues to understand what you're doing to some degree, or you're, you're unburdened by that. No, it's not a matter of understanding. It's a matter of how much work you have to put into. Uh, I, have, I think I have a good perception of what, what the important steps are on the proof, what the, what the major things are. What, what my presentation would lack often would be connective tissue details. Now, somebody that really wants to read, they sit down and they fill in those details, cursing me for not <laughs> helping them out. So if, if, if there's some incentive to read the paper, then it'll, it'll get read. Michael, we began our talk discussing your current work, and now that we've worked right up to the narrative present for the last part of our talk, I'd like to end where we began with some general questions in retrospect. So the first one at the broadest level, what do you understand about the world of mathematics now that you didn't when you were a graduate student? Well, I didn't know much about the world of mathematics when I was a graduate student. I, what I knew was what I'd been exposed to in a few classes and what I'd been exposed to in my, the limited amount of research that I'd done, i.e. working on this particular set of problems. So the, the difference is vast. But mathematics marches on. and So for example, in, since I retired, and like I say, I used to sit in the, uh, on the iron committee and had to read lots of letters and I could learn lots of things from the letters, see what was, problems were thought of to be important who was doing the important work solving those problems. In the last, whatever it is, eight years, I haven't had that, so my knowledge of the current mathematics is far from what it used to be. Just in terms of keeping up with the literature? I wouldn't even say the literature, because very few for example, the people we hire, no, none of them are finite group theorists. It's not active enough area anymore. So I couldn't really read the papers in detail, but what I, what I could, by reading these letters, I could understand what the important problems were and who was doing the important work on them. I understood them at a superficial level, but that was good enough for or having a picture of what mathematics is like. Now, as you say, if, if finite group theory is not as active right now, is that simply a function that you did your job? You, you did the work that needed to be done? Or are those political and trend kinds of considerations? Well, the, this classification problem was a very visible problem. Almost all mathematicians were interested in it. The sporadic groups coming along like they did made it even more interesting. So lots of people were going into this field because it had such great visibility and it was well funded by the, the United States, by NSF and, and other countries by whatever their research programs. And the good universities, by good I mean the ones with good math departments, were hiring people to do finite group theory. Now when this problem disappears, when it's solved, it's a knife in the body of the of this of this discipline. Now there's But that's a the funding issue you're saying. Hmm? That's a funding issue you're well, saying. It's not just funding, it's sociological. Who's gonna go into what students are gonna 
go into the uh, uh, the area of the field. They have a choice. They're probably going to choose something that's more more uh, current. Now there are just knowing the simple groups isn't enough to to do things with them. You you need to know properties. Most importantly, the subgroup structure of these groups and the so-called irreducible representations of these groups. And you have to come up with ways to use this information to, to do the various things that uh, you want to do. So quite frequently, somebody from some other area of mathematics will reduce their problem down to a problem in finite group theory and interest some finite group theorists in the problem and what you do is try to reduce this problem down to essentially a simple group and use this knowledge about subgroup structure and representation theory to solve the problem. So there's important work going on but it's not exciting. Have you ever had what you might call a eureka moment where something was just not clicking and then it did? Small moments, yeah. What does that look like? How do you know when you've achieved the eureka moment? Well, some idea occurs to you and you see that this idea is exactly what you need to remove some obstruction that you've been, that's been causing you problems. Is there a top moment like that if you search your memory? No, I don't think so. Not so much drama. Most of the most of the work I've done is appears in is quite complicated. It appears in very long papers. So you're not gonna have almost by definition, if you have sort of the eureka moment that you're talking about, it doesn't turn into a long paper, it turns into a short paper. <laughs> and besides, if the problem is sufficiently inherently complex, one little idea is not necessarily going to be sufficient. Now what could be sufficient is this idea leads to, is the basis for all sorts of stuff or some, some theory that you have to build up. but So in retrospect, maybe that moment was important. You, but maybe you, at the time you don't realize it. Is there an effort to unify seemingly disparate theories in mathematics? Sure. Is there a notion, like in physics, that there's possibly a theory of, of, of all of mathematics? No. <laughs> Because that's an absurd notion, or because it's unachievable? Well, because the 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 various uh, the the theories that some some theory built on analytic mathematics and analysis, some theory that's built built on algebra. Well, there's geometric geometries that. You can approach them from an algebraic point of view or an analytic point of view, and, and uh, there would be a lot of commonality there. So, but by and large, the two universes that, that are being considered are so divergent that you can't bring them together. You can't because we're limited by our intellect or because they just don't simply don't belong together? They don't belong together. The fundamental problems, ideas, notions are disjoint. Which makes this not very connected to physical reality. Oh, I don't think so. Hmm. You, you, your interview with Schwartz, all, all the, the theoretical physicists are trying to do is build some mathematical model of which uh, they can use to make calculations of the re in the real world, in the physical world. But underlying that is the mathematical model. 
and as their questions they ask become more and more subtle, it seems of necessity the mathematical model is becoming more and more sophisticated. The mathematics that it's using is didn't exist 100 years ago, 50 years ago maybe. I asked you about eureka moments. Conversely, what about problems that no matter what you do, you always hit a wall. Do you come up against that? I don't work very much on such a problem. And if I don't have a, a way into it, then I'm probably not going to try it. Now, if I have a way into it, and it's important enough, then I've always been able to solve it. How do you determine at that early stage if you have a way in? The intuition. Beauty. You have some notions that seem to do things in a simple way. You said earlier until you discovered this level of mathematics, much of life was boring, right? That's, that would suggest, and this gets me to my last question, I think, you'll do this for as long as you can. Right. It keeps things interesting for you. Sure. During the COVID period, I'm sitting at home. What would I do? I Golfing, fishing, doing the crossword, this, this doesn't cut it for you. No. Simply because it doesn't occupy your mind in the way that you want it to. Well, it doesn't. I, it can occupy things other than my mind. For example, I used to play golf in high school. I was on the golf team. Uh, my father loved to play golf, so of necessity I had to play <laughs> golf too. But yeah, some, some period of time, 10, 15 years out of high school, I just lost interest. Do you, do you establish a, a, a research plan? Do you know how long you'll be, you plan to work on a given product or project? Until it's completed or I decide it's not worth working on. So every day essentially is a bit of a surprise. You don't know what it's going to look like. Well, n no, I mean, some period of time is spent developing some, some overall strategy and strategy consists of a bunch of modules, you need some tactics to approach each module. And after you've built up that picture, then you pretty much know, unless something turns out that you didn't foresee something, but that, that's pretty rare. So you, you have a, uh, for some period of time, you're uh, what you're going to be doing is, is more or less there to, to be done. Which gets me, I think, to my last question, Michael, and that is, for as long as you're able to do this, what do you want to accomplish? What are some of the problems you have not yet worked on that, that you want to work on? Well, I have this big project that I'm working on right now, and who knows if I'm going to get it done before I die. So I'll... I'm not going to worry about, I'm going to get this, that done if I, if I last long enough, and then after that I'll worry about it. I must admit, it's getting a little, a little boring. Back in the old days, when you had so many people working in finite groups, that you could take something to, to a place where you're not done, but what needs to be done is obvious, and yeah, there's enough machinery there to, to do it. So, thesis for a graduate student. So you can stop where the interesting stuff is, uh, is done and still see your program uh, brought to a successful conclusion.